Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, first I just want to say it's really great to be here in Seoul. Uh, this is my second time coming. I really love it. It's amazing. Um, I guess just, well, before I start, I'll just, yeah, reintroduce myself. So I'm Anthony. Uh, I lead ecosystem growth at Alio. So really what I focus on is a wide variety of things, mainly working with developers that want to build on our platform, finding different partnership opportunities, and working across product, marketing, and BD. Um, and so, yeah, today I will be giving an overview of Alio. Um, I'll also be talking about some of the technical aspects of the platform for those that are interested. But before I start, I guess I just want to ask, like, how many people in this audience are developers? If you just want to raise your hand. Okay. It's like a good amount, like a little more than half. Um, how many people are already familiar with zero knowledge or, like, understand what it's about? Okay, so it seems like about more than half the room also knows about ZK, so that's really good. That's, that's a lot of uh, good context to have before I start. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about ZK uh, just to give a quick overview, but I won't go too in-depth since it seems like everybody is aware. And so, yeah, we can just jump right into it. So the way I wanted to open up this presentation was actually going through a quick timeline of the crypto industry um, more broadly and explain where Alio is fitting within this roadmap. So if you want to think about the evolution of decentralized systems, technically it started all the way back with things like DigiCash, HashCash, eGold, BitGold. These were all attempts to basically just create digital money. Or like how do we you know, make money digital and put it on the, the internet? Um, and what happened after that is you know, those, those projects all kind of failed. And then we got Bitcoin uh, around 2008, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And the important thing to note here is the innovation with Bitcoin wasn't necessarily the fact that it was digital money, right? People have been trying to do that, but more, that it, more so that it created this crypto economic um, incentive, right? To, to create these decentralized systems and actually have people uh, cooperating, right? And so that was the core innovation there. And then you start to see other projects like Litecoin, BitShares, Zcash, which we'll talk about a little bit in this presentation. Alia was taking a lot of inspiration from them. And then the next evolution, you get people like Vitalik and others thinking like, hmm, okay, this Bitcoin thing is this, you know, decentralized uh, way to, uh, decentralized storage of value, store of value, um, and these economic incentives are really interesting. How do we expand upon that? How can we do more complex applications, right? So then that's where you get the idea of this, you know, uh, on-chain virtual machine. Uh, and so obviously you have Ethereum, and then you have many other projects, which I think a lot of them are represented here today, including Cosmos, which I know is big in Korea, Polkadot, Nier, et cetera. And so what Alio is trying to do is, you know, add to the next layer of this timeline. Uh, and so what we're trying to introduce is this concept of zero knowledge execution or Zexi. And actually in 2018, our co-founder, uh, Howard Wu, uh, along with uh, a few professors um, from various universities, including Berkeley and others, uh, published this paper. And the idea with zero knowledge execution is that um, instead of using something like a trusted execution environment, some of these other methods to generate proofs, uh, you can actually do that um, in a trustless manner. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that actually works in this presentation. And so with Alia, what we want to do is take all these core innovations and implement this new uh, aspect called uh, Zexi. So the idea is take the, the economic incentives of Bitcoin, the virtual machine concept of Ethereum, and then add privacy on top of that. Because we believe that if you want to get mainstream adoption of crypto, you need to have some layer of privacy, right? Like if I, I don't know, if I ask my mom to open an account or, or generate a wallet address, and I tell her, by the way, your neighbor Fred can see everything uh, about your transactions, right? They can see how much money's in your address, they can see what you're spending on, it's all in the public, and it's all in the open. Most people probably wouldn't be open to that. And that can be extrapolated to a lot of different applications. And so um, that's essentially what we're trying to do here. And Alio is not replacing any of these platforms. It's not you know, an Ethereum killer or anything like that. Uh, it's more so to enable these kinds of privacy-preserving applications that might not otherwise be possible on some of these other platforms. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some examples where maybe you want to use Ethereum instead of Alio, for example, right? Like we're looking at a specific use case set. Um, and so like I mentioned, so Alio is a decentralized platform for zero knowledge applications. Um, just a few key things to highlight. Uh, if you look at this chart to the left, 
one good way to conceptualize ALU is we're trying to take the programmability of something like Ethereum and combine it with with something with the privacy uh, of something like Zcash, right? So Zcash did private money really well. Obviously, Ethereum and others um, have done this on-chain uh, VM model like really well. Uh, and essentially, what we want to do is enable web developers to build uh, private applications. And the really cool thing about Alio is, even outside of a blockchain context, you can use everything that we've built uh, to start creating with zero knowledge, which I think is super powerful. Uh, and two other things I wanted to highlight is that in Alio, there's this concept of running uh, execution off chain, uh, which means that there's zero gas fees. Um, and you have to think like, okay, why do other platforms like Ethereum have gas fees? Well, the idea there is to prevent somebody from like dosing the system uh, because everything's done on chain. Whereas in our model, the, the primary objective is to run these computations off chain. That's where you get the privacy from and then actually upload a zero knowledge proof onto the chain. And that's what gets verified on our network. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. One other thing I will mention, because it is a caveat, you can have on-chain computation in shared state if you want, but you just have to remember, anything that you're doing on-chain is not going to be private. So you just need to keep that in mind uh, if you decide to, to operate in that model, right? It just depends on the kind of use case you're trying to build. If I'm trying to build a Uniswap on Alio, well, I need to have some uh, on-chain computation or shared state. Um, but maybe if I want to do like a fully private identity solution, then I would probably run everything off-chain. Um, and then the other good, nice thing is that with that off-chain property, you also get unlimited application runtime. So one thing that we really want to push is developers to create these more and more complex applications uh, that are going to be required to, yeah, to, to build out some of these really interesting use cases that people have been thinking about. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, um, Alio allows users to run the ZK applications on the web. Uh, these are the three main actors within the Alio ecosystem, and they all map to like a different level of our stack. So I just quickly wanted to go through each of those actors and how they actually participate in the network. Um, so it makes the most sense to start with developers, right? So developers, these are people maybe like yourself, somebody that wants to deploy a program on Alio or create some kind of application. And the way they do that is actually through a functional programming language for zero knowledge circuits that we developed called Leo. So this is a ZK DSL and compiler. Um, and going a little bit more into that, basically what you can do is you can write your high level program in Leo, that compiles to an intermediate representation called Alio instructions, and then that go, uh, compiles to R1CS, which stands for uh, rank, rank one constraint systems. Uh, so yeah. That's basically how developers are able to easily you know, start building uh, on Alio. And the cool thing about Leo is that it's designed to be similar to something like TypeScript, uh, JavaScript, you know, languages that a web developer would be familiar with. So even if you might think, oh, I have to learn another programming language, it's actually not too difficult to, to onboard into. Like, I'm not a developer myself, but I've learned how to use Leo, so I like to use myself as a case study here. Uh, it, it is really... Uh, intuitive. And in the future, we could have the option to actually have other programming languages target our virtual machine. Um, that's not on the roadmap right now, but it is something that we have considered. And so you have uh, application developers. The second group are provers. So provers are basically individuals who run the applications that developers deploy onto Alio. Um, and the way they do that is they actually use physical hardware um, to generate zero knowledge proofs. So um, if you want to think about it uh, this way, essentially we have provers on the network and we have them actually competing against each other to generate these proofs as a way to incentivize the creation of more efficient hardware. Um, and that's really important because right now generating zero knowledge proofs is very costly and inefficient in a lot of cases. Um, and we're you know, trying to contribute to the general ecosystem um, by creating a specific incentive mechanism that allows for folks to um, you know, create that more efficient hardware. And at a high level, the way that works is basically we have something called a Coinbase puzzle, right? This is similar uh, to like an operation in Bitcoin where in Bitcoin you have miners um, competing for a block reward. Here it's a similar idea. You have provers that are competing for this Coinbase puzzle reward. 
Um, and depending on the amount of uh, computing power that you contributed to solve that Coinbase puzzle, you will receive a pro rata share of the reward. So again, it's it functions similarly to like a block reward in Bitcoin. And essentially, what those provers are generating is not a full zero knowledge proof, but something called a polynomial commitment scheme. It's not used for anything. It's just there so that there's something for the provers to do. Um, and again, to, to make sure that they're you know, optimizing their hardware and competing. Um, so again, it's just an incentive mechanism. And then the second way that provers can be incentivized is through something called proofs as a service. So the general idea with proofs as a service is that if I'm an end user and I need a zero knowledge proof generated for some application deployed on Alio, but I don't have the hardware to do that, right? Because this hardware is expensive and you know, maybe you don't know how to actually like run a prover on the network, you're just an average user. I can outsource the proof generation to a prover. And that gets really interesting because then you can start to see these like proof marketplaces develop. And in fact, we're talking with a number of partners to try and uh, establish those. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting opportunities there. And we think that the price will be set basically you know, based on uh, supply and demand within the market once this comes to fruition. Um, and all of this is handled within uh, Snark VM, which is, which is our distributed virtual machine for uh, Zaxi, uh, the zero-knowledge executions. One thing I should say is uh, Snark VM is a ZK VM. It's not a ZK EVM. Uh, I know there's a lot of hype around ZK EVMs, especially last year. Um, we've specifically chosen to build our own ZKVM because inherently to build the types of privacy preserving applications that you would build on Alio are simply not possible or feasible like on the Ethereum virtual machine, for example. And all of our co-founders actually came from the Ethereum ecosystem, realized this problem, and that's why they decided to build everything from the ground up. A lot of this has to do with the kinds of opcodes that the EVM supports and so on and so forth. And then finally, the last um, group that you have on the Alio network are validators. So validators are the ones that actually contribute to consensus on Alio. So provers, everything I just talked to uh, talked about with provers, uh, they do not contribute to consensus. Again, we have our incentive mechanism. Uh, I think I forgot to mention this, but that incentive mechanism is a proof of work based system called proof of succinct work. That's not part of consensus. It's just there to incentivize um, better hardware creation. Validators can contribute to consensus. They use Alio BFT. Um, it's, if you're familiar with the consensus mechanism that Aptos uses, it's the same one. It's Bullshark. Um, we're currently implementing that right now. That's one of the last pieces that we need to launch mainnet uh, in the coming months. Um, and in our system, you could also call validators verifiers. So again, the, the, the process here is I'm a developer. I deploy a program. I'm a prover. I run that program that's been deployed. And then that zero knowledge proof gets added to the chain and the validators verify those proofs and then it gets added to the blockchain. And the cool thing about that is once you have a zero knowledge proof added to the blockchain, it's there forever and publicly viewable. And so I can actually use that zero knowledge proof in various different contexts. And again, why is a zero knowledge proof cool? Because it allows you to maintain privacy, right? So a zero knowledge proof is just a way to prove that so, prove some statement that I'm providing to you without revealing the underlying information. So just to give a practical example, like maybe I want to create like a digital passport, but I don't want to have to reveal all the details about myself, like my birthday, maybe where I was born, whatever else might be on there. Once my uh, ZK proof of my digital identity is on Alio on the blockchain and it's been added, the next time I go to a government agency or a regulatory authority, I can basically give them something called uh, a a view key, and they can, you know, find that zero knowledge proof on the chain, verify that it's accurate, and they never had to see any information about myself. Uh, so that's really cool, and all of that is happening within our operating system. So all three of these things kind of fit together, and that's how you get uh, Alio. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, proof of succinct work is basically a incentive mechanism that we designed. It takes some of the traditional components of uh, proof of work that's used in Bitcoin 
and elements of this uh, paper that was written by one of our advisors, Aki Katas, um, called Proof of Necessary Work. And so the general idea with proof of succinct work is that all it, so maybe you've heard like in, in Bitcoin circles that like proof of work is really bad for the environment, there's all this expended energy that's wasted. The idea of the paper with proof of necessary work is that all of the um, computation or energy that's expended actually has a useful purpose. So we're not necessarily reducing the amount of um, output that's being used, but at least it has a purpose. And it's all designed in such a way uh, for generating zero knowledge proofs. Um, so that's the proof of succinct work part. That is not part of consensus, uh, as you were asking about there. The consensus mechanism sits with the validators on the network, and that consensus mechanism is called AlioBFT. Um, and again, it is the consensus mechanism that like Aptos and a few other projects are using. It's called Bullshark. It's a DAG-based architecture, and um, I think there's a few nuanced reasons why our team decided to implement Bullshark as our consensus mechanism. Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure of all the nuanced reasons, but um, that is what they are using uh, for coming to consensus. And again, for consensus, really what we're just saying is like those validators are analyzing all the proofs that the provers are adding uh, that want to add to the chain that they want to add to the chain, validating that they're legitimate, and then like actually like adding it to the blockchain. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is just like another visual to see like developers, provers, and validators. Um, again, like. Without all three of these components, you can't really have Alio. Uh, and then this visual is just a way to kind of do like a one-to-one -one comparison against Ethereum. So again, like in Ethereum, you have smart contract developers. In Alio, you have uh, program developers. In our system, we call them programs, but it's generally kind of the same idea. Uh, Alio, you have provers. Uh, in Ethereum, you have a lot of projects working on things like rollups. So these are like layer two scaling solutions, right? They're using ZK to scale Ethereum. In our system, like functionally, like we do everything that a rollup does, but there's no concept of a layer two because everything's baked into the L1 itself. So functionally, what the rollups would be doing in Ethereum, you could not one to one equate to provers, but it's kind of like the same sort of idea there. And then, okay, well obviously Ethereum now is validators because it's proof of stake based, but it used to be miners, validators and miners, uh, or sorry, validators on Alio, validators on Ethereum. Again, functioning as the same kind of uh, piece, right? They are contributing uh, to consensus on both of these networks. So if you're trying to think about like how that fits or what the comparison might look like, this is a way that you could visualize it. Um, and again, I sort of mentioned this before, but like the, the main thing with our programming language is that uh, essentially you are able to take like the cryptographic like heavy mathematical aspects of like generating a zero knowledge proof and actually convert it into like some program evaluation that your computer can understand, right? And so this is, I guess, a relatively new phenomenon and we've, we've now, we're now seeing a lot of different projects developing ZK DSLs, right? So there's other ones out there like, well, CIRCOM was actually like one of the first, right? You have Noir, which is like one that another project Aztec is working on. You have Zocrates, Snarky JS. There's like a lot of a lot of different ones, but the general idea here is like, again, we can easily convert all this complex math and cryptography into something that your computer can actually reason with. And so now, for like the very first time, um, you, you're able to to actually build something with ZK because before what you would have to do is typically like write your own circuits um, or you'd have to be, you know, in a lot of cases like really well versed in Rust or some of these other more complex languages. So um, that's, yeah, really helpful. Um, yeah, so I kind of went over this, but one thing I wanted to point out here is our on-chain program registry. So what is this? Um, when you generate a zero knowledge proof on Alio, right, since a zero knowledge proof is completely like private, right? It's not giving you any information about uh, the statement that you're proving, like any, any underlying data. It's important that we know like what program it's actually running through. And so we have this concept of like an on-chain program registry. So when I write a program on Alio, I actually deploy it on this registry. 
And in fact, if you go to our block explorer, um, you can search every program that's been deployed on the ALEO network, uh, which I think is really useful, uh, especially for folks that kind of want to see, you know, what are other kinds of programs that are built. Um, maybe you could even, you know, ALEO is also like a composable uh, network, so it's like very easy to take aspects of like other programs people deployed uh, and compound it onto something that you're trying to build, and we're also trying to create a lot of libraries for that too. Um, but uh, yeah, and one other thing I would say about programs is that, and this is a question a lot of people ask is like, how do you guys deal with like regulatory compliance? So one of the things about Alio is that it's a private by default platform, which basically means that by default, when you write a program on Alio, everything is private. But you as an application developer have the ability to decide what information you want to have public and what information you want to have private within a program. So like a practical example of this could be like, you know, in Korea, uh, all the apps on your phone are very specific to this country. And a lot of that has to do with like data privacy and things of that nature. What you could do is you could actually deploy a program that's maybe designed specifically for the Korean market that says like, okay, if we identify that this user running this program is Korean, then you know some uh, aspect of the program will trigger and a new set of steps will occur, right? To make ensure that like we're meeting whatever regulation the Korean government puts in place for applications that you know we want to build or deploy that have some level of privacy. Uh, and I think that's really cool because um, it's yeah, you're getting that privacy aspect, but it's actually giving you more security like over these applications and more security over people's data and information. Like, we really want to push this as an enabling technology. We don't want to throw out this word privacy and be like, oh, it's you know, this dark, people are trying to hide stuff. It's more for like user uh, data protection. Um, and that's really good because you can actually prevent like outside actors or you know, foreign governments or whatever from like trying to access these people's information because all you would see is a zero knowledge proof. So anyway, I think the program registry is like a really important aspect. The fact that we're private by default is a really important aspect. So you write your program, you put on that registry, um, validators will add them, um, and then you get your transaction deployment. The second step is executing the program off chain. So again, like I said, you, uh, when you deploy a program and you wanna execute it, that's done off chain by approver. Again, if there's a program that has some on chain state, that would happen as well. But Again, for the fully private applications, you would do it off-chain. Um, and again, if you, you yourself can be a prover and you know, do this yourself, but if you're not, you can just act as a caller, uh, which basically means, like again, you're trying to outsource your computation to a prover. They can do all of that. Um, and then once they generate the zero-knowledge proof, they output uh, this transaction execution. And then the last step is like, okay, we take that transaction execution that's represented as a zero-knowledge proof, and we finalize the program state on chain. So, um, and, and that finalizing all happens by the validators and the data is entirely encrypted. One other thing that I would say, so aside from the programs being private by default, um, you as an end user can selectively reveal information if you so choose, right? So I'll give like a very basic example. A lot of people give this one, but like, you know, let's say I finalized my, I'll use the identity example. Let's say I finalized, um, this program on chain, okay, I have my digital identity and okay, let's say I'm in the US and I wanna go to a bar, you have to be 21. What you can do is you can go to the bar, you can present this proof, it's like, okay, you are who you say you are, but like, are you over 21? Well, I can selectively reveal a piece of information that could indicate that, right? Instead of having to give them the whole ID or passport or whatever document it is that you would use today. Um, and so again, that's, that kind of fits into the narrative of like the private by default aspect that I explained earlier. Um, not only developers building programs can get that, but end users can too. Uh, and so I also wanted to talk about like a few applications. I kind of spoke about a few as I was going through this presentation. Uh, one area that's of um, you know interest to a lot of people is adding uh, some of these privacy preserving properties to like DeFi applications. So uh, I guess you could call it like zero knowledge DeFi. I, I like the term ZeFi, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, we can try to coin that term. Uh, but basically, I've listed a few here. Uh, one basic one is like zero knowledge token swaps. So uh, one thing that people always talk about is like MEV and front running is being, a, well, okay. 
depends on who you ask. There's a lot of debate. Right? It's, is, do you need some level of MEV? Is it good to have it at all? But aside from that debate, you can basically uh, you know, enable decentralized exchanges without fear of MEV if you wanted to, uh, which I think is like really useful and, and can, can give more like, power to individuals uh, that want to like, use these DeFi protocols. Uh, verifiable oracles, that's another one. So we actually have a grantee that's working on this right now. So, um, you know, just looking at like attestations about off-chain data, again, without having to reveal it using zero knowledge proofs. Um, this is a, I think, you know, the whole Oracle problem is something a lot of chains are, you know, struggling with. And so um, having verifiable oracles is like super interesting. And then another one I have here is cross-chain routing. So you can think like private settlement layer for like multiple different ecosystems. Um, I think that's pretty interesting as well. One thing, one other thing that I would say is uh, also related to the financial applications that also combines a level of identity is like, let's say I wanted to trade like on-chain derivatives and I need to prove my credit score. We could prove that you meet some threshold of a credit score so that you can start doing these on-chain derivatives, again, without having to provide like all this extra documentation information. One thing that I would add that a lot of people ask about is like, okay, well, what about the origination, or origination of the data or documents or information that you're using to create the proof? That is still gonna have to come from some agency or from some database or somewhere, right? There has to, has to be somewhere that we're gathering this underlying data. That probably isn't gonna change, but the benefit here is that once I collect all that data information, I generate a proof for whatever I'm trying to represent, I've just significantly reduced the attack vector with which it can be exposed, right? Because if you think about it, when I go to website A, B, C, D, I always have to like re-enter my information. Now that information is on like five different sites or databases where it could be compromised as opposed to like, okay, I generate zero knowledge proof once and then I use that zero knowledge proof across these different sites or places where I need to provide the information and now there's less of an attack surface for all that data to be compromised. A uh, few other ones that I find really interesting. So zero knowledge gaming, This is we actually get the most inbound interest around zero knowledge gaming. I would say that where this really applies is for imperfect information games. So these are games where essentially the um, each party can only see certain information. Um, they don't have like a full complete view of everything that's going on and aside from you know, traditional games like chess or Go, like things like this, most games are imperfect information games. And assuming that you want to decentralize them, which is another debate we could have, then you need to use some kind of way to enable privacy, right? And we think zero knowledge proofs is the best way to do that. There are other methods, um, but at this very moment, you know, ZK has, has strong promise there. To give one basic example, you can think about, um, you know, like a, let, let's say you're playing like an MMORPG or something. Uh, and you have an army and you're attacking somebody else, right? And you have like resources to build that army. Well, if we decentralize that game and we don't have privacy, then I can see like all the resources, resources you have. So I know exactly like what you're capable of doing to me. Uh, whereas like if I have zero knowledge involved, it's like, okay, the only information I see is when you attack, but I don't know what your reserves are. I don't know what resources you have to create new weapons and stuff like that. And so you can actually enable uh, these existing games that you would play in a Web2 context, but now we can have it decentralized. And maybe I should talk about why you would want to have it decentralized. Well, just like how, you know, Bitcoin is trying to, like, you know, uh, improve the current financial system by eliminating, like, these central intermediaries and having people locked in, it's the same idea. Like, instead of being locked into Steam or something like that, I can now build out a game, build my profile, and like expand that to other ecosystems and actually have more control uh, and like value over all the time and energy that I poured into this game. Um, so that's maybe a reason you would want to decentralize it. Another one that we've really been looking at uh, as well now is privacy preserving machine learning. Um, okay, I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll, I'll finish up quickly, but privacy preserving machine learning. Really big, uh, easy way to think about it is I want to prove that the output of some machine learning algorithm is correct, um, and I don't want to have to rerun the, the algorithm myself, right? You can now do that with a zero knowledge proof, because all I have to do is validate the zero knowledge proof of the output, and that has a lot of wide scale applications. Um, you can also, you know, have more privacy over the data that you're actually inputting as well. Uh, and then, talked about identity, another one is like zero knowledge authentication. I think this is like really interesting as well. So. 
basic one here is imagine I'm able to log into a website with a zero knowledge proof instead of ending like entering like a username or password or using like a federated login like single sign on with Google or something like that, right? Um, again, that gives you like way more protection because if the um, database got hacked or something like that, all the attacker is going to see is a bunch of zero knowledge proofs that don't give them any information about you know, logging into that person's account. So you get a lot of uh, interesting you know, security over there. Um, so yeah, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll wrap up, is that if you want to get involved, there's kind of like three main ways right now. We have a developer grants program for builders. So if you want to build something on the network, we're really looking for tooling and infrastructure. That's big, but uh, also general applications. If you're a white hat hacker or security researcher, we have a bug bounty program on both HackerOne and BugCrowd right now. Um, we're looking for people to find vulnerabilities in our operating system in VM, which comprises our core protocol. At least leading up to mainnet, we'll probably expand that to deployed programs as well in the future. And then the last one, we have incentives for deployed programs on our current test net. So there's a bunch of ALIO credits up for grabs. Um, we're gonna be rewarding like the top programs deployed. You can basically build whatever you want. We wanna see you know, how creative you are and what you can come up with. And if you want any information, we have blog posts on each of these at our uh, website on our blog. If you wanna take a picture of this real quickly, here's some more resources. We are redesigning our website and we'll have all of this more cleanly <laughs> presented, but like this last one is actually really useful because it has real projects that people have built. So this awesome Alio GitHub repo uh, that's on our founder's account. And yeah, uh, I will leave it at that. Um, if you wanna connect with me, you can scan my telegram, but uh, thank you, really appreciate it.